I have a question. If a computer could talk, what would it say? This is Harry Porter, and he built a computer, actually a CPU, out of relays. And because it's a physical device, it possibly could be the only talking computer ever. So this is the document that Harry Porter wrote after building this relay computer. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because I want you to see that a computer is a physical device. It's a it's made of electronics and it's organized in a very structured pattern to do what a computer does. And the basis of all programming is based on these electrical organizational patterns with without the pattern you can't program it it doesn't work you have to have this consistency if any one of these components breaks your computer's broken okay so um, this is a relay this is basically what uh, the main component of his computer is he's got relays and memory chips the relays are uh, responsible for doing all the computation. Uh, the memory chips just store data. So, uh, and he goes into uh, detail on how this computer is organized. This is yeah, how he's doing all his logic, not and or XOR. Um, uh, he's got it all broken out into the different sections of this the CPU functions um, and he explains like here's the bus that's how data uh, transfers he explains exactly how this thing works and uh, he actually sets up the programming language like uh, you know these these bits right here are the instructions but he chose what the instructions are he could have had him anything he wanted. Uh, this is just what he chose. Uh, and this is part of the machine language. And uh, each CPU has its own machine language because whoever builds the computer uh, designs the instruction set. And I mean, this is the computer. And uh, again, the only reason why I'm showing you any of this is because I want you to see that everything in the computers there's nothing magical everything is an electrical component all wired together in a specific fashion uh, to have a, a, a method of configuration which is programming language and a method of execution which is what the electronics does and it just runs these programs and uh, you know it if if we wouldn't have designed this machine, uh, like for example, if if you didn't have this documentation and you walked up to this guy's relay computer, trying to figure out how to program it would take you a very very long time. Um, and this is very simple. This is just binary, binary. Uh, well, if you read this document, uh, it explains binary. Uh, and there's other places you can you can uh, get to explain what binary is um, but let's look at the size of this machine I'm trying to find uh, well here's his programming language so here's an example of a program um, doing some math and some various things nothing complicated not even a hint of graphics let alone anything really complicated like a physics engine or anything like that. So this is what he used: 1,400 relays, 500 LEDs, 100 switches, 1,000 boards, 1,200 cabinets, 160 power supplies, a whole bunch of RAM chips. He spent $5,000 on all those components to make this computer system. This actually, it's not a computer system; it's just a CPU. This is an example of an old-fashioned vacuum tube board. Uh, I think this is four bits, but it might be eight bits. It doesn't really matter. It's just one 
bite. Uh, this is a picture of a floppy disk that has about 1.6 million of the boards. So if you can figure out how big that would have to be to store that kind of memory. Um, just to keep that in mind, it is different. A disk is uh, magnetic. Uh, this is a, a, an IC chip that provides uh, some logic. Um, it looks like it's four AND gates. Um, this is a schematic of um, basically the computer that Harry made. Uh, this is just the, the ALU. Um, so this is just uh, computations and and moving data around. So now that we know what a computer is, let's talk about what a quantum computer is and how to program that. A quantum computer is using the atomics as the electrical components. Um, so you're no longer using electrical pathways, you're using the actual atoms and their arrangement for logic. So let's say I have my atoms here. Uh, this is atom A and this is atom B. And each one of these represents a qubit. It doesn't really matter how they have it arranged, I don't know. And it's probably a trade secret anyways. But let's just hypothetically say that I have two qubits here. And so I'm going to charge this one, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to charge this one red, okay, and red could be the speed or the, the, the spin or the, it could be any attribute of an atom that you can measure and set or dictate. So when I set this red, because all atoms are intertwined by gravity, magnetism, electronic fields, all these different properties of physics. And then you have the, the spooky theory quantum uh, stuff. When I set this one to red, this was white. But now, instead of white, let's just say it turns black. Okay, so now because I set this red, that turned to black. And then when I read the states of these qubits, I get, uh, you know, this new result. And they talk about uh, entanglement, and this is an example of entanglement, but, but really all at atoms and matter in close proximity are entangled in any number of ways. Uh, like, for example, on a quantum computer you have to really regulate the temperature because when something changes temperature it, it it's a, a radiation effect it radiates out and everything else around it warms up and and the, the easiest way to define temperature is kind of like the speed of the molecule uh, that's kinda of how a microwave you know boils water is it it vibrates the molecule and the molecule goes faster and faster and it heats up. Um, now when they get into the quantum field, no matter what you say about any type of angle or perception of the particle, you're going to get a debate because everything's so intertwined, any model that you use to try to explain it is going to leave out uh, details uh, in another model. Uh, like for example temperature if you heat something up it speeds up so if you're measuring speed and the temperature changes then your entire data set is corrupted uh, and since you're talking about very small particles uh, you know like uh, somebody walking by or uh, a loud bang or uh, uh, you know, somebody has have a microwave too close to the quantum computer, or you know, an earthquake, or uh, the wind blowing, or you know, a, a rat farting down the street. I mean, there's so many things that can affect this thing, even though you know you use amplitudes to try to modulate out interference. I mean, that's what radio does. That's, I mean. 
you know that's what every all technologies do is you try try to uh, use a spectrum that will filter out the noise and so this is what they're talking about when they're talking about programming this computer first you have to design the physical structure of it so first how are you going to lay out the atoms and the molecular structure and then how are they going to create logic gates um, you know like for example if I entangle these two atoms and you know now I, I turn this one red and then that turn this one black and then I turn around and I, I, I make this one blue right so now this one turns um, I, I, I don't know let's uh, let's make it uh, green you know and then when I read it I'm only looking at uh, you know the speed or the size or, or whatever of the the atomic structure and so I get these ones and zeros and they they talk about these theories uh, you know like this uh, guy has a, a cat in a box and a, and and next to the box is a machine that will kill the cat but since you don't know if the machine's on or not the cat is supposedly both alive and dead because you don't know well I'm gonna have to go ahead and say that 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 is nonsense it, the cat's either alive or dead just because you doesn't you don't know doesn't mean that it's in a quasi non-defined state it just means that you are unaware like for example if I tell you I'm going on a road trip to Florida and I live in California um, I'm not in every single spot in between Florida and California on the way there because you don't know where I'm at I'm on a route traveling you just have no idea what that is now they do use probability and statistics and a bunch of math to basically say that you know if I do this then this particles ninety percent gonna do that five percent gonna do that and they figure out all these distribution curves and waves and and they say well uh, this is kind of what's going to happen. So you tell me, how are you going to configure these atoms so that you can do math um, and get the result that you want? And old Java program. Um, so to think about what we were talking about when we were talking about programming a computer, that was low-level um, machine code. This program here could easily be a thousand kilobytes of data, uh, of program code, just to execute AES, which is the same type of encryption that is, uh, you know, behind um, Bitcoin. Um, and this is the computer program. I'm not going to bore you with how it works and everything, but what I am going to do is I'm going to scroll through it and here's some consonants and um, blah 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 and this is the program okay so I mean uh, you know there's a lot to it it's doing all kinds of you know carry the one and you know add the flex capacitors um, you know and can you know mangle the little bits and and all these things are going on to to get this encryption going so now I want you to think back to what a quantum computer supposedly is I want you to uh, explain to me how they're going to arrange all these atoms and 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 come up with this uh, equation where the interdependencies of the behaviors of atoms uh, and their interactions with each other are going to um, replicate this encryption algorithm to the point where they can use these quantum computer qubits um, to uh, crack all encryption and, and nanoseconds and all this stuff that they're claiming that this quantum computer bit is going to do. Now, I don't think quantum computers are worthless I see them more as something for communications uh, I mean I don't know it, it might be possible but I just to me I, I sleep 
fine at night. I'm not worried about uh, the quantum computer uh, hacking the planet uh, scenario. Uh, I mean, maybe one day, but I mean, first we have to understand how atoms work. And in contrast to our computer that we designed all the components and then we assembled them together, um, we're using components that already exist. We're using atoms and molecules, and and we didn't we didn't de design their behavior. They do what they do. Um, you know, like if I kick a table, I mean the billions of nuances that happen in that event. I, I mean that's just the universe. Um, so. I, I hope that I've helped kind of explain what it is that uh, a quantum computer is supposed to do and uh, why I don't think that it's really anything to, to worry about. Um, another problem with um, quantum computers is you're kind of stuck in the mentality that uh, uh, you know correlation equals causation I mean when you're programming this thing or trying to figure out how to program it and you enter in this one sequence and you always get this other sequence out of it is that because you entered in that sequence or is that because uh, you know that's just you know every time you look at it you just happen to be look at it uh, you know the the effect of you know uh, Chernobyl's 80 years ago or any number of things that could be going on at this completely insane microscopic level but uh, don't listen to me let's listen to uh, the guy at uh, M, M wave they're building these uh, quantum computers so let's go based on uh, what this guy is saying and ask yourself one thing how sure does this guy seem or how much of this would you guess is bluffing and hopefully you're good at poker this matrix is just some object that describes what states and energies are allowed in your system. The, the energies are the eigenvalues, the states are the eigenvectors that correspond to those. So if you want to find those, all you have to do is diagonalize this matrix. So in some ways of thinking of it, quantum mechanics is nothing but a huge exercise in matrix diagonalization. The issue is the matrices are exponentially large, and so usually you can't just brute force uh, solve Schrodinger's equation, which is the double-edged sword that you're trying to use, actually, when you build a quantum computer. So the way that AQC works is that you have a Hamiltonian, this matrix, that has terms that have, are functions of time. So you have a quantum system, and you somehow have knobs on your box. And you can turn these knobs and actually change this matrix. So think of a matrix with time-dependent coefficients. As you change these knobs, the eigenvalues of the matrix change. So what I'm plotting here are the lowest say 12 eigenvalues of some big matrix and those numbers those energies correspond to the allowed energies of the physical system as I change these knobs in some particular way so the idea behind AQC is uh, that it comes from condensed matter physics originally is that if you begin your evolution in the ground state that is the lowest allowed energy the system that you cannot do better than energetically at the beginning and then you turn these knobs slowly enough what will happen is you will always remain in that blue state now what it means to be in that blue state changes because you're actually changing the physics of the system when you're at the end of your computation when you go in and you read the bits the bits encode the answer to the problem you're trying to solve. So somehow, you have to make it so that the morphing of this Hamiltonian encodes the, the algorithm and, and the answer that you're looking to solve. Now that process is not simple, but there are proofs that show that this approach is universal, which means that any algorithm that you can run on a quantum computer, you can port to this way of thinking about things. 
Now, one of, the, one of the confusing aspects of this, even to experts, is that AQC, the way it was originally defined, is an exact algorithm. AQC fails if at any time you leave this blue thing, and that's just a definition uh, of what, what it means to be AQC. There's a related uh, model which allows you to not get the exact answer and still consider it a success. And this is uh, called quantum annealing. And the idea here is you do everything exactly the same. You still turn your knobs, but you turn them real fast. And by turning them real fast, you lose the guarantee to always get the right answer. But you sometimes can get real good answers anyway. And one way to think about this is as a heuristic. So if you're familiar with things like genetic algorithms or simulated annealing or taboo search or any of these things, there are no, no op optimality guarantees in these approaches, but sometimes they work real well, real fast. And when you just turn the knobs as fast as you can, you'll lose the optimality guarantee, but sometimes you get a real good answer real fast, and that's called quantum annealing. Um, uh, we have a little movie that we generated to try to show you what quantum annealing might look like in a very low dimensional space. So here's a, here's a little uh, movie. Okay, so imagine this thing here is this potential energy that your particle is sitting in. And imagine the ball is the state of your computer. So when you actually going to start it over again, if I can, without screwing things up. Here, watch. Watch as I screw it up. Okay, you start in the global minimum, so that's the lowest energy state, right? That's where we started. And then you morph, you turn the knobs of your Hamiltonian, and the energy changes. And the ball here got trapped in the wrong state, so this is more like quantum annealing than AQC. Quantum mechanics allows you methods to escape from these minima that are not classical. In that case, that was an illustration of tunneling under a barrier. So that if you were doing this classically, you'd get stuck up in that ministable minimum. But this annealing process that, in, that uses these quantum mechanical effects gives you pathways out of traps that you don't have classically. So this is a concept you can have when you think about AQC or quantum annealing. You have a, a surface, like a rubber sheet, and how you pull down the rubber sheet is your program in time. And where the ball ends up is the answer. And when you think about this classically, you've got this ball rolling around on this rubber sheet trying to find the lowest point. And classically, it might get trapped. But in quantum mechanics, there are pathways out of traps that you don't have classically. You can, you can tunnel, do other uh, variant things that use quantum mechanical effects.